Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I spent a lot of years as a Christian, but I only let God into the Sunday morning part of my life. Not into the rest of my life. And I tell you, God is just really fun to hang with once you really begin to learn how to do life with God. So I not only want people to receive Christ, but I want people who already know him to know him better so they can really enjoy a relationship with God. I want everybody to be comfortable hanging out with God. I got about 10 different names of God that I want to teach on this weekend. My purpose being that a name tells you something about a person. So we find there's literally hundreds of names of God, which are basically ways that he's referred to in the Bible. But many of them are capitalized as if they're actually a name for him. Like one of the ones we're going to talk about today is Jehovah Elion, the Lord Most High. And that's all capitalized when you see it. So it's not just a statement, but it's saying that God is above everything else. And so when we really study these names and we look at them, we begin to know God in a deeper and a more intimate way. And the point that I wanted to make is that anybody who really knows God could not possibly not want to have a relationship with him. And then we also have a category of people that do have a semi sort of kind of relationship with God. And what I mean by that is they may have a religious relationship with God where they do believe in God. They may have even said, yes, I believe that Christ died for me. Uh, could even be someone that because they believe in Christ will go to heaven, but they don't really know God. And so maybe they prefer a lot of other things rather than spending time with God because they don't really know how wonderful and amazing that he is. I spent a lot of years as a Christian, but I only let God into the Sunday morning part of my life, not into the rest of my life. And I tell you, God is just really fun to hang with once you really begin to learn how to do life with God. So I not only want people to receive Christ, but I want people who already know him to know him better so they can really enjoy a relationship with God. I want everybody to be comfortable hanging out with God. And so these names, you start with Yahweh, which became Jehovah, and then you have Jehovah Dash and a lot of other names of God. And each one of those talk about a facet of his character or that describes something that God does. So today we want to talk about Jehovah Elion, which means the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, who gives all of our enemies into our hands. Somebody say, amen. amen. Genesis 14, 14, right over in the very beginning of the Bible. And actually Abraham gave God this name at a certain place in his life when something very specific had happened to him. Verse 14, when Abram heard that his nephew had been captured, he armed and led forth the 318 trained servants that were born in his own house and pursued the enemy as far as Dan, which was a place. Now, right away, I think it's interesting to note that Abram went after an army with 318 men. I know quite well that the enemy he was going after had more people than 318. They were probably well armed and well organized. And the thing that I've discovered in restudying these names of God is people who really, really know who God is, they're not cowards. When we really know who God is, it strips the fear right out of our lives. And we begin to come up against our enemies and take action, and we don't mess around with it. We're, we're aggressive, we're not passive. And I even realized this morning, even like in our own nation, and I don't know what kind of issues you have here, probably some similar to what we have, but 
in America. It was a country founded on the Word of God for the purpose of spiritual freedom. And as long as God was number one, everything was going so marvelously well, it was astonishing. And one of the things that we had going for us is we were strong against our enemies. You just kind of didn't mess with America. And that's all changed now. And it's because more and more God's been taken out of things and God is not being honored. And there's a real move there and possibly here also, it's pretty much going on all over the world, all these people trying to get rid of God, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. God started this, he owns it all, it all belongs to him and you just can't throw him out. But it seems like now, the more God is withdrawn from things, the less bold we are, the less brave we are, the more we put up with stuff, the smaller we're letting our armies become. And so I think there's a real connection, not only for nations, but for us as individuals. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Amen? And we are not created by God to be cowards and cower under everything. Even as far as what I said earlier about how many of you really have an issue with being a people pleaser, that's even based in fear. We don't want people to be upset with us. We don't want them to be unhappy with us. We, we want everybody to like us. And sometimes we just need to be bolder and say, I would rather have God's favor than yours. And I'm going to do what God wants me to do and what I believe he's telling me to do because I would rather have a good reputation in heaven and a bad reputation here if that's what I got to have. So he went after them with 318 trained household servants. Verse 15, and he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and he attacked and routed them and pursued them as far as Hobo, which is north of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought back his kinsman Lot and his possessions and the women and the people. So very simply, Abraham took back what the enemy had stolen. Did you hear me? When we know who our God is, we can take back what the enemy has stolen. All right? Verse um, 17. And after his, Abram's return from the defeat and the slaying of, yeah, <laughs> that place. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just don't do all these names well, you know. Sometimes I have to get people to write them out phonetically on paper for me. Um, aren't you glad that I'm not the only one that can't do all this stuff? Or that you're not the only one? And the kings who were with him and the king of Sodom went out to meet at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, later called Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine for his nourishment, and he was the priest of God most high. Now watch verse 19. And he blessed him and he said, blessed, favored, with blessings, made blissful, joyful be Abraham by God most high, possessor and maker of heaven and earth. So therefore, we see God being called Jehovah Elion, the God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, who if we follow him, will enable us to take back everything that the enemy has stolen from us. Somebody give a good shout. Sometimes do you feel like you're outnumbered in life? <laughs> like everything's too much for you? Think about going after an army with 318 people. And you're about to see something here in Judges with Gideon that is equally amazing. Judges chapter six, verse one. But the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. So Israel was not doing what God asked them to do. And to be honest, any time that we don't do what God asks us to do, we only hurt ourselves. We actually open a door 
for the enemy in our lives. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. You can't just resist the devil. You need to submit yourself to God, and in doing that, we actually automatically resist the enemy. Now, none of us are perfect, and thank God for Jesus when we're not, but there's a difference in making mistakes and doing things wrong when you don't have knowledge. It's another whole level when you have knowledge and you do know what you're doing and you do know that it's wrong and you just keep doing it, thinking that you're gonna get by with it. Then out of his great love and mercy, God has to deal with us because if he didn't, he wouldn't really love us. Any parent who would let their child go run out in the street and kill themselves and not correct them certainly wouldn't love them. And so God chastises those whom he loves. Those whom he delights in, he chastises. And Revelation says that those whom he dearly and tenderly loves, he tells them their faults. Well, I remember thinking one time, God, maybe you're loving me a little too much because I just feel like about 20 times a day I'm seeing something else wrong with me. So they got themselves in trouble. They lived in bondage for a good number of years. But God always has somebody prepared that he wants to work through to bring deliverance to his people. Obviously, he brings deliverance to us through Jesus, but he also sends people to help us. He sends people to try to shock us out of our nonsense and our stupidity and get us off of that broad path and back onto the narrow path. God used some people like that in my life, and I hope and pray that he can use me like that in some of your lives even today. So God found a man named Gideon, and he said to him in verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, him being Gideon, and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of fearless courage. Now you're gonna be interested to see that God saw Gideon totally different than Gideon saw himself which is usually the case. If any one of us could see how God sees us and sees what we're really capable of. See, most of you have no idea what you're capable of. You, you probably don't understand that it is ridiculous for me to be doing what I'm doing because in all truth and honesty, I don't have the ability to do it. I don't have the education to do it. I don't have the intelligence to do it. And yet, when you clothe yourself with God, Or I should say, when God clothes you with himself, it's not something we do, he does it. So God sees so much more potential in you than what you see. You're so much more amazing than what you think you are. And Satan would love you just to sit around and think about what you're not and what you don't and what you can't and what you haven't and have you compare yourself with everybody else out there. But God wants you to see yourself the way he sees you and learn to believe what his word says about you. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of fearless courage. And Gideon said, Oh, sir, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this befallen us? And where are all of your wondrous works, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now, what a pathetic response. And I like to even kind of do it like this because I think at that point he was just a little bit wimpy. I think it probably sounded like, oh, sir. <laughs> I, I'm not a mighty man of courage. You've got the wrong man. Who, me? <laughs> you, you want me to what? <laughs> oh, no, sir. That's way too much for me. You got the wrong person. Come on, come on. Well, then God, if you're really with us, then why are we having all these problems and why aren't you doing miracles? <laughs> come on. <laughs> well, mainly because God doesn't wanna have to come and deliver us from everything without us doing anything. He'd like us to stand up against a few things and say, if God be for me, who can be against me? If God is on my side, whom shall I fear? You know, we can't just sit around somewhere and say, me, 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 me. God, we need a miracle, give us a miracle. 
You know, I have a message that I teach called Roll Away the Stone, and I love that message because I noticed about four or five years ago that when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, who had already been dead so long he was stinking, already knowing that he was going to raise him from the dead, he walked up to that tomb, but he said to the people, roll away the stone. Now, if he was getting ready to raise a dead man, why did he need people to roll away the stone? Because God wants us to do what we can do, and then he will always do what we can't do. Some of you need to roll away some stones in your life, and when you do, you will see the resurrection power of Christ doing the part you can't do. You say, well, what, what would those stones be? Well, you might, might try forgiving all the people you're mad at. Well, that's too hard. I just need God to get rid of my enemies. <laughs> No, we are soldiers in the army of God, anointed by the Holy Ghost, full of His power. And it's time for us to stand up and act like it. And not just in church when we've got a cheerleader on the platform getting us all excited. You need to do this in your home. When you get up in the morning and the devil says you're no good and you're going to have a lousy day, you need to say, you are a liar. I am a child of God. He lives in me, and this is going to be the best day of my life. So after that discourse by Gideon, God didn't give up. The Lord turned to him in verse 14 and said, Go in this your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And Gideon said to him, O oh Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Behold, my clan is the poorest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Isn't this sad? <laughs> He's just not giving up. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. And so then Gideon said, Well, if this is really you, then give me a, a sign. And so God did. He ended up giving him a sign. And so we talk about the fleeces of Gideon. And yes, sometimes God will give us confirmation, but I love the scripture that says, Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. God wants us to know him well enough to not have to need proof that he's there. Did you hear me? God wants us to know him well enough to not have to have a bunch of signs, outward things happening. If you haven't heard anything from God in five years, then just keep doing what the last thing was you heard. And when God wants to say something, you don't need to worry. He knows how to make himself known. Amen? And I know it's hard, you know, because God is invisible and he can't be seen. You know, we need him to do stuff. We want him to do stuff. But it's like I said last night, I think sometimes we're looking for these great big things and we don't see them happening. And we really need to look for the little things in our life that really would build our faith to such a degree that nobody would ever be able to convince us that God's not going to do the big things at the right time. Every one of you, let me tell you something. I believe that God shows out in every one of our lives every day if we would just learn to recognize him and see him. Amen? And so we need to stop looking at what we don't have and look at who we do have. I want to say that again. Stop looking at what you don't have and look at who you do have. Judges 6, 34. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with himself and took possession of him, and he blew a trumpet, and the clan of Ebenezer was gathered to him. So God sent Gideon to do something that was impossible, but it became possible when the God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, clothed Gideon with himself. Let me tell you something. Many times before I come out here, I just ask God to throw his mantle around me and enable me to come out and do what he wants me to do. And if we learn to trust God more, it is amazing what you can do that you don't even know that you can do just because God is with you. 
And I thought about Gideon. That was so exciting. Oh, God clothed Gideon with himself. And I think, wow. But then I had another thought. But he lives in us. I'd rather have him in than on. Come on. I said I'd rather have him in than on. He came upon the Old Testament prophets, but we've got him in. He's not going and coming. He's here to stay. He is Jehovah Elion. I love the scripture in 1 Samuel 14, 6. It doesn't matter to God if he saves by many or by few. <laughs> Does not matter to God if he saves by many or by few. Let me tell you a little story that helps get this point across. Back in the very early days of our ministry when I was having little meetings all around St. Louis, totally dependent on God. By then, Dave had quit his full-time job, and so we, you know, God had to show up, you know. Not only do we have to pay for the expenses of the ministry, but our whole salary that we needed came out of that. And so we had, a, we had these meetings and, you know, you get to the point where you can usually count on a certain amount from each meeting and you know what your expenses are. And if you're not careful, you can get your, your mind too much on how many people are there and the meeting and you start depending on all these things you can see rather than the God that you can't see. Amen. And so we had a snowstorm one morning when I went to do the morning meeting. I think it was a Thursday morning. And uh, so we only had maybe 10, 12 people there. <laughs> and boy, the whole time I'm trying to preach, I'm already having to fight off worry about what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I heard that scripture in my heart. And to be honest, I don't even really know that I knew that it was in there at that time. But I just heard that. It doesn't matter to me how many people are here. I could save you either way. Well, it just so happened that day that there was a wealthy woman there whose husband was a famous guy in the sports industry, and she didn't come all the time, but she was there that day, and she put in one check that was generous enough that it more than made up for all the people who weren't there, and the offering that day was bigger than it would have been if we would have had 100 people there. It doesn't matter to God if he saves by many or by few as long as we have our eyes on God. Unfortunately, in a lot of our communities around here in South Africa and this region in KwaZulu-Natal, um, the abuse, the sexual abuse, uh, the physical abuse of as well uh, is quite horrendous. Even in the area, we were, we were scared for the kids. It's heartbreaking when they're missing. I'm not going to let that happen. That's why I'm fighting for this area. Some of the children in this area mm -hmm. have disappeared? Yes. They did. What we did never you... found them. Before we open up this crutch, they are safe, healthy, good. They are good. So these early childhood development centers are not uh, little nice to haves or nursery places where they keep kids, you know, have fun and play games. They do all of those things, but this is actually investing in long term benefit. This really is something that we can install into a community that opens up the door of the community for us to share the gospel and really stands as a witness, as a shining light into the community about the love of Christ. And we have such great opportunities through our Classrooms of Hope to help little guys like this who are going to make a big impact on the world one day. With your missions gift right now, you can provide safe, classroom learning opportunities for young children. You and your special gift today will change lives. You know, the Word of God teaches us that if we are willing to share what we have, God can multiply that 
and make it into a lot more than what we started with. So please share. Help ons om andere mensen te kunnen helpen. Bel ons 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meijer.nl slash partner. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. How do we hold on to trusting God? How can I have faith in God when I don't know how to trust? Well, I've heard your questions on trust, and I want you to know that God cares for you. Everything around us is just falling apart. As you can see, things keep getting worse. I don't know what to do. Well, the good news is that God has given us some very solid answers that we can look to in His Word. My hope is that my newest book will help you discover a trust that is truly unshakable. Bestel nu Volblijdschap Vertrouwen via onze website joyce-meyer.nl slash vertrouwen of bel 026 20 22 100.